and I'll, and, and I'll forward oh, to her. Yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, maybe I'll like to blow her. What? I don't know whether she, you know. Okay. Cheryl's not getting so emails like, from her. My emails don't, don't work, period. From him? From us. No, here. Yeah. Do they go to your junk? No, I don't go to anything. So I don't know why. Don't. But anyway. It's her because he sent them to me, so it's not the pallet and block it. So I got it. so I'm just looking forward to her. Any email I see from Peter, I'm just looking forward to her on that. Well, right. Good afternoon. And I'm sure we're going to be joined by others, but I wanted to uh, go on and get started. Um, I'm Cheryl Love and all of you uh, are familiar with most of you. Um, Today's program is a nod to our international community. Um, and we want to thank Mr. Brooks for um, sharing this concept of connecting um, Fela Kuti, who is Nigerian, and we have quite a large Nigerian population of students, uh, to his grandfather, Cab Calloway. So, on your desk, a couple of things before I introduce Peter. Uh, you have a, uh, a little evaluation. I'm going to ask a few short questions. If at the end of the program you could fill that out, that would be great. And you can leave it on the table. You can bring it up here and leave it on the table. This is a two-part program. So he's going to do his presentation and we'll have a little Q&A um, for about a half hour, 40 minutes. And then we're going to go downstairs uh, for music and dessert, um, and music by the Jazz Ensemble with Mr. Benny Russell. So that's going to immediately following his presentation, right downstairs in that Globe Cafe area, is set up for you to hear some music uh, and have some dessert. So again, thank you and welcome. So get ready. Fasten your seat belts. <laughs> and if these seats don't have any seat belts, then you better hold on because um, we're going to uh, go to several continents and cover thousands of years of traditions in an effort to help us all become better and stronger people and more resilient people coming through and out of COVID. Uh -huh. So Peter Brooks is the icon of esteemed American legend, Cab Calloway. And in a few moments, he's going to show you exactly how he survived a recent traumatic event, the demolition of his grandfather's home in Baltimore. So without further ado, let's join and welcome Peter Brooks. so much. Such an honor to be here. And I want to thank you, Cheryl, Laura, and Benny uh, for allowing me to do this. You know, this is such an important institution to this community. You know, it's the only thing like it for mods. You have to go all the way to Towson or Morgan to find uh, a cultural center like this where ideas can be expressed you know, to people who can listen to them and give feedback. And so it's such a rare and magical thing. And I wanted to thank the institution and encourage you as you become alumni that as the institution asks for your support that you please give it, especially if you are touched or enjoy this presentation in any way, because it wouldn't have happened were it not for the institution. So I just wanted to give that plug really quick, I guess. Once a fundraiser, always a fundraiser. <laughs> anyway, so the question I wanted to ask you, what tools do you use when facing a difficult transition, something traumatic, perhaps the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, all these tough breaks that happen in life? What do you do? I used faith. Faith, yes. Prayer is very, very powerful. Good. I turn inward and go to myself more. 
so, quiet myself. Yes, yeah, so you're a person who wouldn't speak. We'd know something was wrong with Cheryl. She's not speaking. Yes, good. Anyone else? Anyone in here start drinking? I'm sure people do, I mean, as a response to, to difficult times. Uh, maybe not sleeping. Anyone have trouble sleeping? That often gets you. And that thing advanced automatically. The it's just the, it. Or it went to sleep. Yeah. It's what? Or it went to sleep. Your laptop went to sleep. Uh, I'll have to keep it on. So, the, uh, what I'm going to submit to you, I wonder if I can pause it. Space I can advance if you want. You okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, what I'm going to submit to you is that it is your heritage. Looking back to your history, your legacy, that you draw upon to generate things to help you survive. And what I'm about to play for you is the Native American National Anthem, the AIM song. This song, I think, I, I, and I'm starting off a presentation about Cab Calloway's Bela Kuti with a Native American song because I think you as Americans should at least have heard this song once. You know, if we were born in England, we'd know God Save the Queen. If we were born in Nigeria, we'd know the Nigerian songs and stories. They'd at least be familiar with us. So this, I wanted you to have some familiarity with the music that preceded the arrival of Columbus and uh, the First Americans. And since this is Thanksgiving, it's sort of appropriate. Now, the reason why I'm playing this song, and you can advance, is because this is what I draw upon when I face a difficult moment. If, oops, go back, sorry. Uh, thanks. So hold it here till I hold that here. All right, and it'll go forward, it looks like. So, All right, so. This is what I turn to if I can't sleep or face a traumatic event or something like that. And I'm going to wager that whatever stress you're going through right now, whatever's stressing you out or worrying you or giving you anxiety, if you're allowed yourself to listen to this song, it will mitigate whatever is causing you trouble. So here we go, the AIM song. to the right. Ironically, on the day this picture was taken, I thought, I didn't know we were doing a family photo. I thought I was going to granddad's house, so I was going to be like cutting wood, mowing the lawn, you know what I mean, doing the dishes or whatever. And they all got dressed up, and they are still laughing at me about this today. <laughs> all right, next slide. Who was Cab Calloway? When I found the house where he grew up in Baltimore, I had, it really dawned on me, standing in front of that house, that this was the place where he and his sister Blanche conceived of the, how they were going to take over the entertainment industry. 
And their big innovation was that they, especially Kev, was one of the first African-American artists to sing about the conditions in the neighborhood he grew up in and the people who were in that neighborhood and make that popular. These weren't songs about love and stuff like that. This is also the 20s. America is coming off of the ragtime era and the minstrel shows. We're moving into Broadway and we're getting into swing, which Cab Calloway was called the king of swing. So one of the people he hired was a musician named Dizzy Gillespie. Cab was very much on spotting talent. Gave Dizzy his first job. You may have heard of Dizzy Gillespie. Dizzy Gillespie is, was known as the king of bebop jazz. He developed a form of jazz which allowed for very fast improvisations, freestyling with the music. It wasn't as organized as cabs and, and things like that, but there were no words. So bebop has this freestyling improvisational element to it, which leads to hip hop, what we have today. Talking about situation in the ghetto, improving through the uh, freestyling of the lyrics or the melodies and coming up with a new form of music. And that's sort of how it developed. So this is Cab Calloway's role in the development of modern music today. You can also look at it this way. So the people who influenced Cab Calloway would be UB Blake, the tradition of vaudeville and minstrel shows. Fats Waller, Fats Waller and Cab Calloway, very similar in, in the way that they performed, in style. Louis Armstrong was Cab's mentor, gave him his first shot in music, taught him everything he knew. Duke Ellington, another very good friend of Cab Calloway's, influenced him in terms of the big band um, and also sharing musicians. Blanche Calloway, his older sister, and I would argue, growing up, Cab Calloway heard the A Rabbits. Anybody know what an a rabber is? Hit me. a rabbers are the gentlemen on horses who sell fruits and vegetables in the community where there is a food desert. And they go into the communities and they sing their songs to let people know that they're there and then people go out by their, their produce from And are the songs pre-written? Do they sing like Not really. Lady Gaga? Or... No, no. It's, just, it's mostly improv. Heard that? Improv, all right, good. Yeah. So, all of these things influence this young man and, and help him to create his art based on the things around him. His art influences three different, at least three different strands of popular music today. Cab Calloway was really sort of the innovator in terms of popular music for these gentlemen, as, and, and Louis Jordan needs to be on there, thank you very much, Betty. <laughs> anyway, uh, in that whenever you have a male singer who has a very strong charisma and male bravado, who exposes his emotions and feelings really rawly, who kind of gets in and does call and response and, and kind of gets into your life. And that is pretty much what Cab Calloway started, this, this breaking down the proscenium arch between the artist or the singer and the audience. Like, uh, similar to the tradition of cabaret, you know, where the singer gets into the audience. And so these guys all are within that tradition that Cab started. Also, we talked about jazz, the highly creative non-verbal music. He's starting Dizzy Gillespie. Dizzy Gillespie leading to Charlie Parker, leading to Miles Davis. So Cab Calloway has an impact on all types of uh, jazz music, helping people get their jobs started, featuring musicians, Writing songs about musicians is one of Cab's traditions to help the music move forward. And finally, this sort of drugs, blues, and protest music also sort of starts with Cab Calloway. You know, he's the first person to sell a million records with a song called Minnie the Moocher in 1931. He has a hit the very next year called Reefer Man, all right, where he's talking about smoking marijuana. So he's one of the early people to make this idea of singing about drugs popular. And of course, B.B. King with the blues, B.B. King with this ability to express the pain of the African American community, Marvin Gaye, the social protest. Cab Calloway's songs are littered with social protest, but you have to read within to see it. Fela Kuti, the opposite. His social protest is in your face. Um, Bob Marley, obviously, 
Grateful Dead as well, just sort of like a drug culture type of thing. So he's associated, his, his impact influences all of this music. And so when you look at his contemporaries, right, these were the people who were popular at the same time as Cat Calloway was. Nat King Cole, Louis Armstrong, anybody? Frank Sinatra. No. Good, and? Sammy Davis Jr. Good. I'm going to submit to you that today, people imitate Cab Calloway style a lot more than any of these gentlemen who were his contemporaries. And I'll prove it to you in just a second. We're not even dealing with his sister, Blanche. Talk about a story of resilience. Imagine what it's like to have your younger brother visit you. You introduce him to your friend, Louis Armstrong. They hit it off, and suddenly your career goes on the decline, but your younger brother's goes on the rise. In 1937, Blanche is arrested in Yazoo, Mississippi for using a white restroom at a filling station. The band somehow escapes, probably because Blanche distracted them, knowing her with her personality. I mean, here's a woman touring, leading an all-male band as a female, which is rare, and then going into the South in 1937. It takes a lot of chutzpah. So the band gets away. She's arrested along with a band member. Thankfully for the NAACP, she was, survived this event, but she had to sell her car in order just to get back to New York to get bail and stuff. And then she gets back to New York and starts around all over again. Blanche also constantly reinventing herself in her career. She managed Ruth Brown, who became the Queen of Soul in the 50s. Here she's pictured with Sugar Ray Leonard and Blanche Calloway, which was the manager. And she also managed boxers and stuff like that in Philadelphia. So an amazing story of resilience, too. I just wanted to touch upon her. This thing, though, is about Cab Calloway, the real hip-hop founder and whose style still resonates to today. Now the song that he did, and you can go to the next slide, but don't play yet, uh, Minnie the Moocher, which I'm about to play for you. And this proves how Cab Calloway is resilient, because what you'll see in this video is oh, how, whoops, yeah, sorry, said, yes. don't play yet. <laughs> it's all right. What you'll see in this video, you'll not only hear his song that was a big hit in 1931, but you'll see his impact on the history of animation. Cab Calloway is one of the first persons ever to be rotoscoped. But his impact is still playing out on animation. Anyone in here familiar with a game called Cuphead? It's getting ready to become an animated series. Well, the nemesis, King Dice, is patterned after Cab Calloway. And they're about to come out with a series of cartoons that will feature King Dice against Cuphead. So, Cab Calloway in the history of animation. Folks, now here's a story about she was a real hot blue teacher. She was the roughest, toughest friend. Minnie had a heart as big as the way. Queen and Margaret, he's the only person of color in the entire room 
And Edward G. Robinson. I always thought they favored each other. Well, uh, let's get started. That's a Eric Stoner, the Cincinnati Kid. That's a Howard. Glad to know you, guys. So, in addition, he uh, has a him huge impact on language. These words like boogie, you know, in 1937, he introduces this word, boogie. Um, he co-writes a song with Glenn Miller called Boog It. Glenn Miller dies in 1941, but in 1942, the Andrews sisters cut a song called Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy of Company B. Ever since then, just about any song that has the word boogie in it is a hit. But nobody can really tell you what it is. All right, but it's sort of a, that's sort of a Cab Calloway type of thing. Um, you had mentioned meeting, I think, seeing him with the Nicholas <laughs> Brothers in this oh, one. Yeah. It's a very famous animation or uh, video you might have seen online. Here he's in a magazine advertising beer, a Japanese album um, with his daughter. He's very much of a family man. He was the first African American or or non-white person, person of color, to have his own nationally syndicated radio show, Quizzical, in 1941. And this picture from him in Great Britain. So you have this enormous history, and it's very rich, and it's something I felt that could be built upon, especially because he came from this impoverished neighborhood in Baltimore. Penn North has one of the richest histories in our city, Philly Holiday, the old Royal Theater. Unfortunately, a lot of what marked that rich African-American culture is gone. But today, the grandson of a famed jazz musician, Cap Calloway, says we are in danger of destroying even more. WMAR 2 is Brian Kuber with here with more on that story. Jimmy, Cap Calloway was raised in West Baltimore. One of the homes in which he lived is on Druid Hill Avenue, a block currently slated for demolition. But now comes his grandson, who is trying to convince the city not to raise the history of one of the most celebrated musicians of that era. Hey, folks, here's a story about Minnie the Moocha. According to Cap Calloway's grandson, Minnie the Moocha walked the streets of West Baltimore. Peter Brooks feels Druid Hill Avenue shaped Cat Calloway's life in his most formative years in this home just south of North Avenue. At the age of 11 to 16, Brooks says his grandfather learned his expression from West Baltimore. He really becomes, as a result, the grandfather of the hip hop movement, and that he was the first African American to sing about the conditions in the neighborhood he came from in a sort of a documentary style fashion. A foundation built right here at 2216 Druid Hill Avenue. The home today, this entire block, may now be slated for demolition. The Community Development Corporation here has been planning a large part, but it's just last month that Callaway's grandson discovered that this home here was once home to the jazz great. I just tried to tell everybody I could that, wait a minute, you know, don't demolish this house, the 17,000 other houses you can demolish, but put this one last on the list, if at all, because there may be a potential here, an opportunity to better the city and bring tourists in. But this is the last home in this area that Cal Calloway family lived in that's not been demolished. And there really is nothing in this area to commemorate Cal Calloway uh, and the great history. So it's, you know, there's an asset here. There's a potential for tourism here. Marty Petrelli began the effort to save this home when she stumbled upon its significance. She says it's a no-brainer to connect this with the growing effort of the historic designation of Pennsylvania Avenue, celebrating the rich African-American heritage of this neighborhood. Callaway's grandson says he wants to work with the city and the community association, hoping to strike a chord for the entire country to hear. All I'm saying is, before you demolish it, take a moment and think about it, and let's see if we can if we can do something uh, that's positive for the people here in this community. Now Brooks tells us the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation, or CHAP, may also get involved here. Their next meeting is scheduled for July 9th. Okay, so here I am trying to preserve his 
legacy, and I'm creating uh, media like this, and I'm trying to indicate to people in the hip hop industry that, hey, if we can't preserve the legacy of your founders, how are we going to preserve your legacy? You know, and this is something for young people to think about. What is going to be your legacy? And as I pointed out here, like Miles Davis's home was in a similar position. Satchel Paige, a great pitcher. Nina Simone, who was also a contemporary of Cavs, a singer. Houses in much the same uh, condition, but they were saved. And the communities came together and saved them. And as I was doing all of this, next slide, yeah, I, I was doing it because I didn't want what happened to Dizzy Gillespie to happen to Cavs. This was the place where Dizzy Gillespie was born and they raised it and turned it into a park. And as I said, the house just, some, and this is not me, but somehow it just spoke to me. And when a supernatural event happens like that in your life, you know, you're willing to risk anything because you think that, you know, it's a spiritual thing, something greater than me is happening here. And so in the midst, I was fighting against the most powerful people in Baltimore, City Hall, with aspirations for the city council and governorship and stuff like that. Even my cousin Josh, who came from Washington State to bless the demolition of the project. And just as the house was about to be demolished, in about June of 2019, something happened. My doppelganger, Elvis Presley's grandson, commit suicide. Half my age. Dude, I would have loved if my grandfather was Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley is definitely in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He is the king of rock and roll. He was probably the first entry and the first, uh, 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 of the first class for the rock and roll history. I mean, his fa he had died in a $1.8 million home. Wow. Elvis Presley's home is the single most visited private residence in the United States of America. More people come here than go to the White House, or the Biltmore Estate, or the Hearst Estate, or the Rockefeller Estate. Elvis Presley, dude had everything. My grandfather's house is now rubble. It's gone, it's been demolished. He had money, power, prestige, fame, everything and all i had was my grandfather and yet he commits suicide and why i could certainly relate that slide the pressure was too much everywhere benjamin went people said to him you look just like elvis and of course they probably said do you sing as well and he felt Rather than supporting his grandfather, he felt competitive to him. And I have felt that as well. But for me, I kind of thought, well, you know, there's only one way I can guarantee you're going to lose. And that's if you quit. But as long as you keep fighting, there's a chance still that you can win. And so the difference between me and, and Benjamin partly because of the heritage and legacy, but this is what I would submit to him if I had had a chance to talk to him. You are here. Your grandfather's not. So people gotta take what they get, whether you sing or dance or do nothing. And he had the opportunity to do nothing. I mean, he had so much money that he, you know, could have done nothing. But I would submit to you that if he were actively involved in preserving his grandfather's heritage, he'd still be here today because his life would have a mission. And we know that when we give to other people, that's what gives our life meaning, when we help others, especially our grandparents. And so he never saw that his grandfather ever needed any help, because he was so big and everything was just so, you know, done for him. And at about the same time, I understand that Fela Kuti is up for induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. My grandfather isn't even nominated, even isn't even considered, and yet someone from another country who does an entirely different form of failure is not known as a rock and roll anything, really, uh, gets nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame before my grandfather. And if you ask my grandfather, next slide, you say, I said, Granddad, 
what is your role in the history of rock and roll? This is what he would say. I think if anybody started rock and roll, I did. I would never get credit for it. Never, nobody ever, I guess never, there was never been another one to come along, a singer, that improvised melodies as much as I did, which eventually, eventually wound up being rock and roll. Next slide. I think if anybody started rock and roll, I did. So, so who is this guy who gets nominated to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame before my grandfather? Next slide. Fela Kuti. Fela basically combines the high theatrics of Louis Jordan, who was influenced by my grandfather, with the jump style sort of hyper reality, this musically induced clock stopping moment that Count Basie was known for with songs like One O'Clock Jump, along with the hypersexuality and the rhythms and things of James Brown. Combine all of those things with his very strong belief in his Orishas or the traditional African religion, and that's what creates Fela Kuti. Fela is really, and this is his, what I feel is his you know, big achievement, he is the first open shaman to use music as a tool. That's something, yeah, that's, that raises your eyebrows. He is an actual shaman on stage performing rituals, and so that's why it's so devastating to see his performances. But I would argue, oh yeah, I played some music, there you go. For those of you who hadn't heard it before, good. Okay, you go ahead. I would argue that Cab Calloway was a shaman too. See if I'm wrong. singing is sort of a shamanistic trance type type of thing. Anyone else think of other things that these two guys have in common other than shamanism? Hmm. Floor is open. This is when you gotta make sure you see what's it. Yes! And we're gonna hit on that. A very strong belief on their ancestral spirits. Yes. Anyone else? They both lead big bands, right? Go ahead, next slide. Mm -hmm. So yes, in terms of getting deep into their lives, each of them had very strong mothers. Cab's mother taught him music. Fela's mother taught him his traditions, as well as his civil rights history. They were both heavily involved in politics. Their families were as well. Um, they were both big band leaders. They were both iconic. They, they sort of stand out amongst all of the people around them. Uh, they both started whole new genres of music. Fela starting Afro pop, Cab pretty much starting swing or being known for that, even though there were other musicians before that. He was called the king of swing. Um, they both promoted this sort of trance music, losing control of yourself, which later becomes extremely popular in rock and roll. This idea, especially with the Grateful Dead, that you that the musical experience is meant to be an unconscious type of free you know, let your mind go, creative type of thing. Um, they had relationships to politicians. FDR is really associated with Cab Calloway, the New Deal. This is going to be the new multicultural America. Thela had a relationship to just about any post-colonial government uh, that was in Africa at the time, particularly his own. Um, they were both had siblings who were very strong before them. Cab's older sister, 
paved the way for him in the music industry. Fela's older brother was the Minister of Health for the nation of Nigeria. They were both very prolific. Once these guys started working, they never stopped. They never like took vacations and stuff. They just kept on producing. Within their style of performance, there's a very strong bravado, masculinity. There's a lot of taunting in the music of both people. Um, you know, Cab uh, has, you know, I have them in London, I have them in London, in Holland, I have them in Gay Parry, yes siree, yes siree, oh the Heidi Ho man, that's me. You know, that's one of Cab's lyrics. Um, and both known for having, you know, many women and being very, I just found out that my aunt was Winona on Good Times. Who knew? Carry on. <laughs> um, differences. Bela does not try to fit in, but Cab does. Cab tries to work within the Broadway system, you know, uh, but Fela is going to create his whole, whole new thing. Cab was, as I said, obsessed with helping musicians along. Uh, Nat King Cole really mentored under him a lot. Even Michael Jackson came to Cab Calloway for mentorship, and the door was always open. He would buy instruments for his musicians and stuff like that. Fela Kuti, not as much known for that kind of thing. Um, with Fela, it was the death of his mother which kind of radicalized him to a certain extent. I mean, he went into hyperdrive when they killed his mother. Cab lost his father when he was a young boy, and just about all of Cab Calloway's music and stuff is designed, I believe, to try to prevent suicide. Um, one believed in clothing. Cab definitely believed in wearing clothes. Fela, not so. <laughs> um, they go on opposite trends here. Fela, known for smoking marijuana, not so much for drugs and not so much for alcohol. Cab hated marijuana, even though he sang about it. They had to hide musicians who wanted to smoke away from him because he would fire you on the spot. Um, not so much drugs, but Cab loved to drink. Um, Cab stayed with sort of horses and gambling and being living this kind of great life for myself, whereas Fela Kuti is trying to create a republic. He's trying to move a mass number of people and create something new for them based on his knowledge of his traditions. And finally, uh, Fela's quote, teacher, don't teach me nonsense. Uh, Cab Calloway believed you go to school, you get a graduate degree, etc. Uh, in fact, Cab Calloway's nickname amongst musicians was Fess, short for professor, because he was always teaching. But the key thing that both do, as you pointed out, is they go back to their heritage. And this becomes not only the source of their resilience, but also their creativity. Cab Calloway, looking back to his childhood and the A-rappers for improvised melodies. Watermelon, strawberry too. I got coconut and peaches for you. Improvised melody. Fela Kuti, looking back to his experiences with his ancient Yoruba rituals and practices, and that's what he's bringing out to the world. Next slide. Cab Calloway's music almost tells stories as if, you know, you're in a barber shop with a bunch of other African-American men. Folks, here's the story about Minnie the Moocher. It was down in Chinatown, and all the junkies hang around. Now, that's his style. It's like, yeah, everybody enjoys the story. They understand the coded language. Fela, more for the groups, more for the masses. This, is, I think, is how, when Fela's writing music, he's imagining you know, a, a large group of people, whereas Cab, a more intimate room of men that are all enjoying what he's doing. Next slide. And finally, both look to their heritage. And can you hit play on this? Top one above cab. Can't see this. The music kind of captures the New York lifestyle, the pace. Okay, and the next one. Whereas Fela's the more placid life of Nigeria. Yeah, we're working with you now. So, 
And that's what I did. And that's how I survived. I went back to my Native American heritage. So with whatever Benjamin was doing at that time, when he was 27, I was going around in traditional regalia and going back to the source of, you know what I mean, this history and stuff that was here. And that's what helped me to become Brazilian, learning these little songs and dances and stuff like that. So basically, what I'm saying is that your history, all right, which becomes your heritage, feeds your legacy. Your future, what you leave behind, is built on what the people have provided before you. And it doesn't have to be your heritage necessarily. It can be any heritage that resonates with you. Great story. You know, George Washington was not Roman. He was not Italian, nothing, right? But he was really inspired by Cincinnatus. Cincinnatus was a great Roman general, conquered the Gauls. When he came back after the war, they begged him, they said, Cincinnatus, please take over, take over Rome. He said, no. I'm going back to my farm. And he did, did, did not become emperor of Rome. He went back to his farm. Same thing happened to George Washington. After his second term as president, they begged him to stay on. Please run this country. Be the emperor. You can be president for life. You're the greatest among us. What did George Washington say? No. I'm going back to my farm. Mount Vernon. All right? Cincinnati was not his heritage. But that is now his legacy. And where did Cincinnati get it from? probably from his history. You know, his parents, somehow, he learned that this was the right thing to do. And so it doesn't have to necessarily be your heritage. It can be any heritage that you can build upon, which will enable you to have the resilience to create a legacy to leave behind for others to follow. And so, I can tell you that story, and I can give you that tool. Go back to the earliest thing you can find, bring it up to the modern, and try to contextualize it. This will be something new. Whatever you bring back has resilience because it's thousands of years old, presumably, or hundreds of years old, or what have you, and it, it is very new for today. And I can tell you that that works because, as I said, I mean, Benjamin Kehoe, Elvis Presley's grandson, is not here, but I am, and I'm twice his age. So that's my tool for you. As artists, your heritage, your history is not only the source of your creativity, but also the source of your strength as a human being. Because that's what artists do. Artists go ahead of everybody else and say, hey, this is what's out here, y'all. This is where y'all are headed. So in order to survive out there by yourself, you have to have that strong link to your history. Because any time a traumatic event happens, the first thing we say is, well, what did we do last time? You know what I mean? What did we do like, well, last time we had a big disease, we, we, we came up with a vaccine, polio, yeah. That's what we did last time, we'll do it again this time. So your heritage, your history, is how you survive your traumatic events as they occur in real life. That's my story, and I'm big. Stick it to it. <laughs> Thank you. Please remain seated to the plane comes to the <laughs> complete stop. <laughs> Charlotte. So I have a question. Um, can I make Callaway work? Yes. And you can play Coastal first. Yes. So a little bit about that. Sure. So this is my mom uh, that was speaking up. Basically, what happened was uh, the, UB, the original UB Blake Center had, had been destroyed by a fire. And the city was thinking, yeah, we probably don't need this thing any anyway. And this is like one of the only things to honor UB Blake in Baltimore. And here again, I could have done this whole lecture about UB Blake. UB Blake's history is the fact that when he went to Broadway and wrote an all-black musical, prior to then, if people were going to be black, they got in blackface. And they did minstrel shows. And they made fun of being black. After UB Blake, they stopped doing it because his show was so sophisticated and so good and so equal or above what they were doing that they decided that this is really not the right thing to do because obviously African-American people are human beings. I mean, they can do anything any other human being can do. And so that was 
really powerful. Um, Blanche Calloway, who we mentioned, she also leaves home, runs away from home to join Newby Blake in, in the touring production of his musical Shuffle Along. So it was Cabaret Calloway Murphy who, after the original building was destroyed, went to the city, went to, I guess it was Governor Schaefer at the time, and secured the money to preserve the Newby Blake Center and get it into a new place, which was donated by Wash, uh, the uh, Maryland General Hospital, what it was at the time. It was a building that they weren't using. And so the UB Blake Center exists today as kind of an after-school center for young people to learn music and other cultural arts and stuff like that um, in the city of Baltimore. And, and that one is downtown, and I was trying to do something like that, perhaps, uptown in, in Penn North. Um, I had all kinds of ideas. I mean, you know, it was, it was interesting, because then you look at Prince and Prince's legacy. You know, Prince tried to create this sort of production center, you know what I mean, that would live on beyond him. And Tyler Perry, I think, is doing the same thing. So people are thinking about their legacy. And the sooner you do it as a young person, the better, because then you'll make decisions. You know, is this really how I want to be remembered as you go along? Because you'll be contemplating your legacy. That will give you that ability. And you know, oh, I forgot to mention the, uh, the fact that Cab's music was using these sort of chants, right? Heidi, Heidi, Heidi. And I wanted to show how that was also drawing upon his heritage when we did the beginning. All right, that sort of chanting Cab Calloway brings into the music, which is probably a nod, either consciously or unconsciously, to his Native American heritage. So no other singers really do all that kind of thing. Okay, is there another question? Good. Is Bayer making it to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? No, he does not this year. First okay. time ballot, he did he not. Get in. Okay. But it was close. Um, it's basically a popularity contest, so if people don't know. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking maybe I'll just start this like campaign to try to get him in, so let's see how. how it works. Like I'm sure the experience. Food Fighters got in because of popularity, right? Who's that? The Food Fighters were up, up to one of the other groups. Yeah. I mean, most people have heard of them. I've never heard of Bayo, ever. Never, wow. So this was very likely to make. Yeah, you'll need your seatbelt for Fela, too. <laughs> yeah. Fela, Fela will begin a song saying, it's time for another underground spiritual game. And that was like the first words of the song, you know what I mean? So you know you're dealing with something really deep. Mm -hmm. All right, so with that said, we have uh, a jazz band yes. that's going to, right downstairs, uh, along with our dessert, do this Fela Kuti song. Um, Benny Russell is going to lead that. But I also want to just ask Dr. T, because uh, I know that uh, she's uh, familiar a little. Was there anything you wanted to say or add about uh, Fela? Oh, good. And what yes. it yes. And thank you. This was a really good presentation. Thank you for the background and bringing us from there to the present. I happen to be familiar with Zenith music. I grew up with Zenith music, and uh, I remember I went to what you call the shrine. Of course, my mom didn't go to the shrine with my first cousin and my cousins. But everything you said about him is true. Uh, he was with the government. He was very confrontational. Mm -hmm. His mother, though, was his inspiration. Mm -hmm. And when the government caught him, they threw his mother from a tall story building down. Yep, they just dropped her. Just yeah. dropped her. It was, it was, she was it a was frail old woman. woman. Yeah. He was imprisoned too many times, but yep. they just threw each other. Yep. His brother, like you said, one was a minister yep. of um, health in Nigeria, and the other one was a doctor too. It was a doctor too. Both of them are dead. But yeah, his mother was the first female driver, and she was a so he had her as, a, as his installation. So he's, even up to now, I mean, his house is there, he's still there, and he's a legend. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and all of us draw inspiration from the legacy that he left behind, uh, which was very prolific. And guys, I gotta tell you, if you, it's, it's, I mean, most of you guys have only heard Fela on MP3s or, or musical devices. When you hear it live, it's a totally different experience because it's really, it's alive in front of you. 
And so uh, since Fela is no longer with us, you know, this is a real privilege because it's not a lot of people can play this music. It's very, very, very difficult. Okay. So you're in for a real treat just, just to see this band later, you know, in just a few minutes. All right. Thank you I for think doing with this. That said, yes. uh, I want to thank you for today and thank your presentation. You. Please thank you. Looking for my grade. All right. All right. Uh, she was the first one here. Uh -huh. You can take uh, this evaluation form with you downstairs. Uh, we have some dessert downstairs, and we're going to uh, hear the tune downstairs. Awesome. And then also, he'll be back in February. Yes. Got Speaking uh, on Cab Calloway and the Harlem Renaissance. So right. thank you. Join us downstairs. So I guess the technology failed is a good thing for me today. I wouldn't have been here. Wow. Let me go downstairs. Okay. Can I this? Yeah, we're going to bring it downstairs. Hey, Peter. Oh, yeah. yeah. We, 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 we drifted. I didn't bring my book back. <laughs> Thank you. Here you go. Uh, if, uh -huh. I, if I can do it, it depends on my schedule. Yeah, good. You need what? If I could do it, like I didn't have a plan. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. I'm going to do it. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. You'll have to even report that to Kat. Tell her that. Tell she her. hasn't seen it. Really? No. I haven't had a chance to. Her. She's so busy. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. I just finished it yesterday. Of course. Because you were presenting today. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I can have any Oh, okay, good. I'm coming down. Yeah, yeah great. Well, I figure maybe someone can still pull it up. Yeah. Hey, Bobby, how are you? Hey, Bobby, how are you? I told you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told you what to do. Study your history. Yeah, you know yeah, just figure you out to get yourself because you've got the gifts. I'm talking about talking to you on the phone. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Great job, Peter. Thank you. 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 Thank you.